Uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm just glad to be here with with you this morning and um, to, to to celebrate him. How many of you know um, what question I'm going to ask right now? How many of you brought one of these along with you? I just hold them up. Oh, Noah, you're forgiven. He's got one in the back. There you go. Why do we keep saying this? We keep saying something about why we want you to bring this. You got to get used to what? Come on now, get used to what? Open in the book, right? And then what else? Opening what? Open in our hearts to what's in it. Can we say it together? We got to get used to opening the book and opening our heart to what's in it. Can we say it again? We got to get used to opening the book and opening our hearts to what's in it. Because it doesn't matter if we just read it. It doesn't matter. People have read scripture for, for centuries, the, the, Jewish, um, the, the whole Jewish nation read the scriptures and missed Jesus. T- t- this morning, it's not about, oh, we went to church and we read the scripture. It, it doesn't matter unless our hearts are open to it. And so this morning, I can't do that for you. I can do it for me, and gratefully I will. <laughs> but for you to say, God, what, what are you saying to me this morning? And we got to get used to that because it's not just a weekend thing. It should be in our every day that there's these moments of like, Lord, what are you, what are you saying to me? And, and hopefully taking time just to dig into his word in those moments as well. Uh, we spoke about our vision as a church. What is it? Helping people? Good. Thanks for the tip. We can all read it together. What is it? Helping people? Find Christ in community. And you're like, you guys say it like you don't believe it. You know, just a bunch of like, oh, find Christ. Man, do you realize what finding Christ is all about? <laughs> that is like, oh, the joy, the delight in knowing him. We're talking about that this morning. But helping people find Christ. Because if you're here and, you know, you, you're new to church and you're like, what is all this about? Our desire is that your eyes would be opened to see who Christ is. Not religion, not some stories about a cross and, you know, Christmas and Easter. The joy of who Jesus is. And maybe you're here and you've been to church lots of times and you still haven't caught that. Our hope this morning is your eyes would be open. You're like, I get it. I know why they can sing with every breath. Great, great are you, Lord. that's That's our hope this morning. And if you're here and you're like, I'm a Jesus follower, man, my hope is that you find Christ today. It doesn't matter if you, you know, last week was awesome, if yesterday was awesome. You need him today. And hopefully that is what a part of what happens here this morning is our like pursuit of him, body, soul, spirit. We want to know him, to pursue him daily. I read a quote last week. I just want to leave it. It's the only one from last week that I want to share is this. Uh, uh, Leonard Ravenhill uh, said, I keep reading articles about how to make your church grow bigger, but I seldom find any about how to make your church go deeper. I read lots of articles about how to make your church grow bigger, but I see seldom read articles that teach you how to make your church grow deeper. And as, you know, as a church, you know, I love it that we're full. I love it that there's a crowd here, but that's the, that's the bare minimum goal. My hope is that each and every one of you digs deeper, that you know Christ for yourself, that you don't allow anybody else to, uh, to or assume that someone's going to do it for you, but that you just pursue him. In the, in the thickest of the, the turmoil, pursue him. At the highest mountain peak, pursue him. Pursue him today. And if somebody's like distracting you in the back, just tell them, stop, I need to listen to this. That's right. All right, let's go. Ready? Yeah, here we start. So any of you play a game called Balderdash? Anybody familiar with Balderdash? We got anybody like Balderdash? Some of you are like, yeah, you know, yeah, it's an awesome game. Next time we do our games day here, we're bringing Balderdash because uh, it's just it's such a fun, creative game where uh, if you're not familiar with it, you get a card and it gives you things like a word and a dictionary word, and you've got to make up a definition that's believable to others. I, I'm terrible at this game because I just always want it to be funny, and so everybody's like, oh, pff, that's not the real one. That's definitely Mark, right? So I never get points, but I just I just love trying to make people laugh with this game. Uh, and then you know you have movies, titles, and you have to describe what the movies about. And then they have this one where there's acronyms where they give you a bunch of letters and you decide what it means. But there's, we're, we're familiar with acronyms and most of us are familiar with what they actually mean. And so we're going to do a little test. You can sort of shout it out if you know what these acronyms mean. So let's start with this one. First one. Too much information, right? Like uh, that, you know, maybe the service will be too much information in the, in the quantity, but not in the personal stuff this morning. But you got it. TMI. What else? What's the next one? Right, not what would John drink. All right, next. Uh Uh-huh, and some of you older ones were like, what? Move along. How many of you know what this one is? Hey, FOMO, fear of missing out. What about this one? All the shoppers. 
<laughs> Vulgo, that's my language. Sweet. What, what about this one? Don't know. No, nobody knows this one? Great. Let's jump into scripture and find out. So if you have your Bible, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you got your Bibles, start turning towards the right. You're going to pass the red letters in the Gospels, and then you'll see Acts, and then um, Romans, and then Corinthians. And you're going to go to the second letter of Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthians. It's one of, a, we think, four. Uh, this may have been his third letter to them, uh, or fourth even. But he writes this, he says in verse 8. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed. We were overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. You know, here's Paul's like, he's like, just gives us a little greeting. Hey, everybody, how are you? Let me tell you about my life. And we just went through the toughest toughest thing in our lives, trouble that was beyond what we were ready for, we thought beyond our ability to endure. We didn't even think we were going to live through it. And if you read through Acts, you'll see that Paul, when he was in Asia, um, he was in this place called Ephesus, and they started this massive riot. They wanted to tear the guy limb from limb. They wanted him dead. And he was like, in that moment, I didn't know if I was going to come out on the other end alive. Trouble. You ever experience trouble? Trouble. Like stuff that you're like, man, I, I am overwhelmed. This is more than I think I can handle. Have you ever been there? You know, the, the, the thing of thinking, man, that there's events that, are in your, that, are, that happen in your life that are beyond your ability to process or to, to think you can even endure or seasons of life that you think they're out of control. Like relationals, like, man, those teen years, I don't know. I don't even know what to, what to do. You know, we're financial, and you're like, man, if the economy doesn't turn around soon, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Or maybe you struggle with addiction, and you're like, man, I'm like powerless. I, everything that I want to do, I cannot find myself doing. I feel like I'm, I'm stuck. Anybody ever face trouble? Yeah, Paul did too. You know, we typically don't like or enjoy the seasons of trouble. Nobody's like, oh, more trouble. Sure, sign me up. I'll take some more of that. We, we, we actually do the opposite. You know, we, we try and avoid trouble at all costs. We try and control the scenarios around us so that we don't have to go through trouble. You know, we, we'll, we'll be like, well, you know, if I, if I withdraw from this, I won't have to face trouble. Or we will try and talk our way out of trouble. Ever been there? Or manipulate everybody else around you to try and avoid trouble. And yet it still comes. No matter what we do, it still comes in our life. And Paul encountered these kind of troubles, these overwhelming troubles as well. But here's his response. Let's read the next verse, verse 9. He says, uh, actually, we expected to die. He's like, that's how difficult this trouble was. We didn't think we were coming out alive. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Rely only on God can also be read, rely uh, on God only. Rogo, rely on God only. You know, and I read this, that's how I read it the first time. I was like, oh, I can remember that. And it was this little prompt in my, you know, my mind. That's how I remember things. You know, Rogo, rely on God only. And then later on I read it, it was like, oh, it's not actually that. But Rug is not as cool as Rogo. <laughs> so Rogo, rely on God only. Paul's like, man, I didn't, I didn't want to go through this trouble. I actually didn't think I was going to survive it. And yet God was at work through this overwhelming situation in my life. He hadn't forgotten. He was still working. And what, did, what happened? He said, you know what, I, what happened to me? I learned how to rogo. I learned how to rely on God only. Through this thing, which I thought was going to crush me, I learned something. And what is it? Rely simply means trust. I learned to put full confidence in. That's, that's what he's saying. I learned, how, I learned how to put full confidence in God. I was thinking about that. I was reminded of when we took our kids this summer to... Um, to this uh, high ropes course, uh, what's it called again? The factory. The factory is, uh, uh, they took the Kellogg's factory in London and changed it into this ropes course and, uh, you know, bouncy place. It's phenomenal. But there's like this, there's uh, one of my uh, children on the uh, high ropes course, and you see that, that the space in between. There's about seven of those stories tall, and I don't know which one they're on, but I'm watching from the side. I'm like, this is like, ugh, they really trust. They really trust all of these ropes and wires, and, but, but not completely. 
See, they, they walk on these little boards and these little, you know, things, these little platforms, but they also have this tether line that's tied to another cable up above them. And so it's not like they fully trust the, the, the platform they're on because they've got something else holding them. I was like, oh, good. The, that, that will hold them. The tether line will hold them. At least they're safe. And then uh, they get all the way to the top, and then they do this. Do we have the next video? Yeah, so there's a zip line at the top of this building, and they only are on the tether line. It's like just clicked onto that, and there they go across this, uh, this high thing. And I was like, <gasps> and I'm like, don't do that again. But you have to, because the only way off is to go back to the other side and come back again. And I'm just a dad. I'm like, man, if that thing doesn't hold them, they're toast. That is full confidence. If it doesn't hold me, I'm toast. Well, as you say, we learned how to rely on, not on ourselves, we rely on God. If he doesn't hold me, I'm toast. See, a lot of times as Christians, we think we have this reliance on God or this trust in God, but he says, through this thing, through this troubles beyond my ability, I learned my abilities are, are nothing to be trusted in, but that I can trust in him. If he doesn't hold me, I'm done, but, but he holds me. And he says, you know, not just rely on God, but to rely on him only, not half-half. You know, not in, the, not in the spots where I'm like, I rely on God in some areas of my life. I trust God with some areas. Salvation, yes, I trust him. Occupation, no, I got this. God, you want my money? No, I can do what I want with my money. I can do what I want with my kids, with my life, my fun. What? It's like, God, I don't trust you that your that you're joy is enough. I don't trust, I, and we, 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 don't, we don't say it out loud, but our lives speak it. And he says, I don't trust him, you know, just sometimes. But all the time. It's not just my Sunday gig that I, that I trust God, but in all times and all the time. And that I trust God, not others. And so often it's like, oh, I trust my parents. You know, or you're like, well, I trust the government. Or I trust the pastor. Yes, very few of those here. I trust the pa- I trust the pastor. I trust that he's, you know, that I trust his prayers are going to do it for me. No, no, he's like, I don't, we don't trust on, we don't rely on anybody anymore. Uh, what's happened is we've learned to rely on God only. I don't know about you, but have you ever had moments in your life where you realize you're not enough? Where you've relied on you and then you let you down? Addicts know it for sure. But it happens in other ways. I mean, even for myself, this past summer, I realized that when I burnt out, I, I, I started realizing I wasn't okay in here when I started not caring about people. I could care less what happened. And then I was like, this is bad. I need to care. Like, this is my job. I need to care about people. And I would try to make myself care about you. I couldn't even do that. And I'm, I know, I know. But, but where did that come from? Where did that come from? And it's, you know, it took the, the Lord getting me kind of to the spot of brokenness to say, I, I, I'm overwhelmed by all of this. I don't even know where to go from this, where I could just find that I could rely on him. And I had to think back. I'm like, how often did I just trust the gifting? that I could get up here and keep you all awake with speaking? How often did I trust just the gifting without the proper heart prep to be here? Too often. Too often. I was like, man, there's this trusting in ourselves that happens so easy. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't even rely on God enough for me, let alone rely on God enough for the rest of you. And I thought, you know, how often maybe is that happening in churches all around us where we, we make up for a lack of God's presence by putting on programs and putting on cool things and, and trying to make sure that everything around looks really, really great to make up for the lack of his presence. And what we really all we really need is him. Well, who we really need is just him. We don't need great services. We need a great God. We, we don't need like, you know, oh, that was like that just did everything for me, and then leave without knowing him. You know, as, as a person going through life, we need him in the everyday. And I started to realize, you know, sometimes, maybe if I was honest, I just didn't really trust that God was going to be enough. I thought, i got to make sure i got this awesome sermon, these really great points. If I can't come up with one, I'll just borrow somebody's, because it's got to be entertaining, right? It's what they pay me for. <laughs> it's just relying on me. You know what I've learned now is that he's enough. And if he's not enough, we're, we're just wasting our time. We just really are. If you came to hear me this morning or thought it was going to be, you're just wasting your time. Because none of us are enough. If you trust, oh, I can carry from Sunday to Sunday because I just get that little boost and I'm, you're going to let you down. 
But it's that, that realization, no, I, I need him. I'm just going to rely on him only. I'm going to rogo. I'm going to rely on God only. I'm going to trust that he's enough. That's where I am now. He might email me like, that sermon sucked. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I just want you to know him. And so that's the, the heart is what Paul said. Hey, when you face really tough times, you could be learning something. Learning to rely on God only. Paul actually finishes his letter. If you want to just go uh, a few pages to the right, he finishes his letter with another example of this in his life. Just before his final um, closing thoughts in Romans, I mean, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, in verse 5, he again talks about this. Actually, throughout the letter, it, it's so much the letter uh, carries this. He says, that experience is worth boasting about. So just for context, real quick, Paul, Paul was being challenged by the, the Corinthians saying, oh, you're a nobody, you know, you're not a good speaker, you, we don't even know if you're an apostle, and, and he's like, these other people have had these great experiences, and he's like, uh, hello, I, I've seen the risen Jesus, I've had visions of him, I've been into the third heaven, and, and I, man, I know way more than those guys know, and, and he's like, but, but that experience, even though I sh- could boast about it, he's like, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go to that level where it's like, oh, you should trust me because of look what's happened to me. He says, I'm not going there. He says, even though I could boast about it, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to boast only about my weaknesses. Because if I wanted to boast, I'd be no fool in doing so because I'd be telling the truth. But I I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. And they know that in Paul's life, it was what Christ had done. And his message was Christ and Christ crucified. He's like, I don't want your eyes on me. You know, as we read even uh, in, our, in our study, for those who are going through the Bible with us, Paul was, they were, they were talking to him about, you know, you're a nobody. And he's like, wait a second, why are you even like focused on me? He's like, you think I'm like this low. He's like, you don't understand, I'm like this low. He's like, I'm like, you know, Jesus is like the conquering king. And you know when the king conquers a country? He drags all these slaves in chains behind him. He's like, that's who I am. I'm, I'm his slave just pointing to him. He's the overcomer. He's the conqueror. He's the one anybody should be looking at. If you're looking at me, please just see a signpost pointing to him. Because he's the one who's great. And so Paul says, oh, that's all I want you to see and hear. Even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God... So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Verse 8, three times, three different times, I begged the Lord to take that thorn away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And I begged the Lord to take it away. And he replied, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And I begged the Lord to take it away. And he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Aren't you glad he didn't pray 30 times? (laughs) Or 300 like we typically do? God, please take it away. What's Paul saying? He's like, no, his response was the same. He says, so actually, now I'm glad to boast about my weakness. He says, so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions. Here's some words he was talking about at the beginning, this trouble, this overwhelming stuff. He says, uh, he says then this, that I suffer for Christ because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You know, Paul wasn't just learning to rely on God only. He had this reminder to rely on God only. The reminder was this thorn that would keep happening. And it, before his response was, I got to pray. I got to, God, take it away. And now it was like, ah, you know what? It's a reminder. I know what he's going to say. Trust me. Just rely on grace only. Rely on him only. And, you know, I think about the, the reliance on, on God and on his grace only. That's not just for Paul. That's for us. And what's God doing in those moments? I, I believe he's tuning our hearts towards his. You ever... For all the guitarists out there, ever play and then you realize halfway through like the worship set, your like guitar's not in tune, yep. and there's yep. yep, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's like, uh, you know, like hopefully they sing louder or whatever, right? And you hope the sound man turns you down, but you've been there. You're like, or you're out here and you're like, yeah, I, I, I recognized when that happened to you up there, right? It's like. It, it, something doesn't sound right. Something doesn't feel right. It's like we're out of, we're out of tune. We're out of sync. It doesn't, it doesn't feel right. And you know, I think that happens in our lives too. When we're out of tune with the Lord, it's, it just doesn't feel right. We could be sitting here and it just, something doesn't feel right. And I think that's what he's doing is like, he's like, hey man, I want to I wanna get you plugged into the tuner. Like when you plug into the guitar tuner, there's this little needle that moves. And as you strum the thing, it's like, it's like, 
get to that, and you, you turn and turn and turn until you finally get it to go to that spot. And it's like, that's what he's doing in our lives. He's like, man, I know you're facing trouble you can't handle. That's the point. You can't handle it. But God, but God. He's like, yeah, let me get that needle to where it needs to be. Some of you are like, I don't understand instrument stuff. All right, let's talk about cars. You know, for some, you got those, those newfangled cards. I was driving my mother-in-law's car. First time, like, it's watching me. I didn't know I'm driving. All of a sudden, it's like, beep, beep. I look, and like, what's the warning? Out of oil? No. Oh, keep your eyes on the road, it says. I'm like, well, OK. And I'm like reading it, reading it. It's like, keep your eyes on the road. Oh, OK, yeah, keep your eyes on the road. And as I'm driving, and like, you know, I can't help it. I'm like, oh, where's the next Tim Hortons, right? And so as I'm driving, all of a sudden, it's like the steering wheel starts going like this. I'm like, like it's possessed, right? I'm like, I've never experienced anything like this before. I'm like, I want to go that way. But it's like, no, it senses the line. And it's like going to push you over. What's happening? I feel like that's the same thing in us. We hit those spots. It's like, it's like I'm trying to get you back. I'm trying to get you back to that, to that spot, the right road. Because here is where it's right. Here is where it feels right. And he's, he's tuning our hearts. Man, I think about some of the, you know, the old hymns where they would sing about this very thought. Maybe you know them. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. He's like, Lord, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Get, get me to the place where I rely on grace. He fin- Later on in the song, he says these words, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Man, we'd say that too. Like, huh, the, 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 when, when Christ saved my life, man, oh, to grace, how great a debtor. But he says this, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness or their grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Why? Because prone to wander, Lord. I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Written by Robert Robinson. You can see it on the screen. Robert Robinson penned these words in 1757. Man, these are like the songs that last through time. Why? Why? You know, as he wrote these words, Robert was fatherless somewhere between the age of five and his early teens. Lost his dad. His grandfather was upset that his dad had married a lower class woman, so he left him a hundred bucks as his inheritance, even though he was super wealthy. But Robert just continued to to live, and and uh, at age 20, he found the Lord, and it's very, it's kind of humorous. Him and his buddies went to a psychic, and they offered her alcohol in payment, waited till she got drunk, and then waited to see what she would say. And uh, so she was, uh, she was inebriated, and as she's telling these things, it's like there was nothing, and then all of a sudden she looks at him, and she's like, you, you will see your children and your grandchildren. And he's like, I don't know what it was about those words, but it shook me awake to be like, wait, wait, what's, where's my life heading? I haven't thought about children, grandchildren. But all of a sudden he realized there's something. And the Lord used that to draw him to him. And he found the Lord. And uh, as a result, you know, he, he began to, to share that with others. He got married. He had 12 kids. Good, good, you know, Dutch man probably. Um, 12 kids. Uh, then he has a, has a daughter who um, dies at age 17. And it wrecks him. It wrecks him. He, he lives out the words of his song, Prone to Wander. He begins like, God, I don't understand, and goes through all these things, even to the point of almost denying his faith. And yet this song would come back to him 30 years later and remind him. And, and it, it, was this, it was these words, these songs, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. But to your grace, daily I'm constrained to be. He ended his life in poverty, didn't go, you know, as, as, as he had planned. But it's in those last moments where he was like, man... Grace, like a fetter, bind this wandering heart to thee. Take it and seal it for your courts above, realizing that he had to rely on grace only. I think about those other songs like, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Know the rest? Just to rest upon his promise, just to say, Thus saith the Lord. And then the chorus. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Any idea what that song's about? It's in the words. 
Jesus. You sing that song, you sing his name 25 times. Jesus. Jesus, it's, it's you. Oh, for the grace to trust you more. Written by Louisa Stead. Man, here's a woman born in 1850. Got married in her early 20s. 1875, her and her husband and the four-year-old daughter are out at the beach just for a family outing. And they hear the sounds of a young man drowning. And her, her husband gets up and he runs out to run into the water and save this young man's life. But unfortunately, it goes the other way around. The young man drags him under and they both drown. So Louise is here with a four-year-old going through life and, you know, going through all of the, the difficulty of that. Gets to the place where, you know, where many would just say, ah, you know, whatever. She writes those words. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. These are all after the fact. How I've proved him more and more. You know, this, this thing, Jesus, Jesus, precious. Jesus, oh, Lord, grace just to trust you more, to rely on you more. No, the, the trouble's overwhelming, but I've learned to rely on you more. And then you think of amazing grace with John Newton. You know, the, that, that how precious, he says, did that grace appear? How precious was the grace the hour I first believed? What do you hear in this? There's this tuning of their hearts, not just to grace, but to the delight in grace. The delight in what happened at that cross for us. It was not delightful, but its result is. And that's the question I have to you. Is there a delight in your heart? You know, so oftentimes for us, our, our response to these troubles is, is, we, is a fight against it rather than just a simple reliance on him and his grace. You know, the Blue Letter Bible, if you're studying the word and you want to know how to dig deeper in, go to the Blue Letter Bible online, just type it in. You can read all of scripture and you can find out what every word means in Greek and Hebrew and Here's, what, here's how it describes grace. It says this, that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, loveliness. Th th this is what it brings into our lives. Joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, and loveliness. What a word. He, he goes on to describe it this. Oh, the merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ. He keeps and strengthens and increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, and affection, and kindles in them to the exercise of the Christian values. He's like, th this grew grace. Just the beauty of, what, uh, of its description. It's this delightful thing. And the question I have to ask us is, do we delight? Do you have that delight in grace? Do you have the delight in him, that reliance on him? Well, I believe the two are tied together. I think the delight in him comes from the reliance on him. When you learn to rely on God only and nothing else, all of a sudden you discover the delight that there is in that. The God, I trust you. I actually surrender all. It can all be going down around me, but you are enough and my eyes are on you. This is what the, those authors, this is what they're inspired by. Man, you watch these people's lives. They should not have written those songs. What's the song you'd write? What's the song you'd write? Would it be delight? You know, Paul's word to the Ephesians is what inspired many of these songs. And just as we are closing, we're going to close together with communion. So just ask our ushers if you guys can, can uh, grab the elements and <clears throat> um, hand them out. As you're listening, Paul writes these words to the Ephesians. Ephesians 2.8.9. We'll just put it on the screen. Um, and if you can, in the meantime, just go to 1 Corinthians 11 because you're going to have a hard time flipping pages and holding stuff. So just go to 1 Corinthians 11. But eyes on the screen here, it says this, God saved you by his grace. What do we rely on only for salvation? His, his grace. His grace. He says, when you believe, you can't take credit for it. It's a gift from God. Salvation's not a reward for the good things you've done. So none of us can boast about it. Here's that, you know, that Paul's thing saying, it wasn't what I did. It wasn't how I got my life back together. It wasn't how I, I measured up. It was none of it. I just learned how to fully rely on grace. I learned how to rely on grace only. I learned how to rely on God only, the God of grace. And that was his reminder. Throughout his life, there's these reminders. You know, and this morning, what we're about to take part in is a reminder. Come on, fellas. It's a reminder. It is a reminder that Jesus gave to his disciples saying, hey, this is, this is what grace is all about. This is... This is what I want you to remember. I want you to, I want you to think about what I've done for you. And he gives them something that they can hold and something they can touch, something they can experience. Yeah, you can hand them up. Sure. And as they're passing that out, just draw your attention to 1 Corinthians 11. 
go back a few pages, or you're probably there already. 1 Corinthians 11, here's what Paul says. You know, he, he echoes what, what Jesus had done with the disciples at the Last Supper. He echoes this, and he says in verse 23, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, it says the Lord took some bread, and he gave thanks for it. It says, Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took a cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. What is he saying? What's the reminder? What's the thing that he says, Hey, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Do this as a, as a reminder. He, there's two things, and we'll experience those today. He says, as he took bread, he hands that to them. He says, this is my body broken for you. Or this is my body broken on your behalf. Or uh, because it should have been your body broken, but it's mine that's being broken for you. And what is, he, what is he saying? Here's a reminder that there's a cost to sin. That's the reminder. The reminder that sin has a penalty, has a price. That, you know, this picture kind of illustrates that sin is not just a mistake, do we have the photo? Sin's not just a mistake. Sin's like a heavy burden. It's a big deal. Like, I was reminded of, a, even, just, even just as we were worshiping, I was thinking about this. I was reminded of a story of a, of a man who worked for a bank, and he was like, you know, he was, every day, it was back in the day when they actually used coins, and he would, he would skiff some coins from the bank every day, and he'd go home, and he'd throw them up in his attic, and he was always storing all these things in his attic, and uh, he'd always take just, a, just enough that, you know, nobody would find out. And as he continued on, nobody ever did find out until one day as he, they, there was this um, emergency where people were called to his house and they found that he had put so much money in his attic that the weight of it had cracked through the floor and crushed him in his bed. <laughs> it's funny until you think about you. Man, what, what are those little sins we think we're getting away with? We think we're tossing them in the attic and, you know, nobody knows. It's all good. At least I'm at church. It's all good. Man, the, Paul says, listen, I think you need to understand something. He says in Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death. That cost is legit. It's going to catch up to you. And it's not just physical death. It's worse than that. It is the eternal separation from Christ forever. There's this weight to what sin is. And he's like, let this be that reminder to you. My body was broken because there's a cost to sin. You know, Paul reminds the Romans about it, reminds the Corinthians about it, but he offers them hope. And so I want to share a quick story before we take communion together, and it's about my dog, Reba, just because she's the best dog ever. You know, Reba, um, <clears throat> she used to be terrified of everyone. We think she was, like, abused or something before we got her by a woman with long blonde hair because she would go nowhere near Beth. <laughs> she was nobody's friend except our children's. And then all of a sudden she got converted and she became everyone's best friend to the point where she was not satisfied to just be our dog. She wanted to be the neighbor's dog and the other neighbor's dog and the other neighbor's dog as well. And every day she would make the loop and go and visit the other people's houses and be their dog for a while. And she would come back because she knew where she could eat. Uh, and so we realized this is not a good thing. It's a problem. And so we said we got to find a way to keep her on the property and found these underground fences and decided we would install one. And uh, you put the collar on her. And so when she'd get to the perimeter, what would happen? She'd get there and the beep, beep, beep would go. And she'd like, at first she didn't quite realize what it was and would carry on. And then all of a sudden, bzzz, right, the buzz. And then the shock, right? Like, we didn't do the shock. But if she'd find these spots and go to these spots, I'm like, beep, beep, beep. Oh, I can't go there. And then go this way. Beep, beep, beep. I can't go there. And always wanting to find her way around to this other place. And so because we're Dutch, we figured our property's big. We don't want to put a perimeter all the way around. We'll just make a kind of one that goes across the driveway. That's where she normally goes. Well, didn't she realize that she could not go across the driveway? And then one day we realized she's at the neighbor's. How is she getting there? And she'd go to the back of our property and find this little path and go there, go around the pond, go to the neighbor's house, and then cross the road from there and go visit all of her friends. And so we're like, 
You know, as I'm thinking about that, I was like, man, I wonder what's going through her mind. She's like, those stupid masters, like, they just don't want me to have any fun, but I'm going to find my way because I want to ha have my own way. And, and, and she doesn't realize that in my mind, I'm thinking, you foolish dog, I don't want you to meet a semi truck. That's why uh, we have a busy, busy road. I'm trying to, I'm trying to save your life. You know, and uh, after realize she's finding her way around, I was like, I got to try something new with this dog. And so for the last little while, we've just been, uh, anytime we go outside, we're like, we make a big deal about the fact that the dog is there. It's like, I'll go in the morning, Reba, oh, Reba, Reba, Reba. And she'll run up and she'll spin and twist and I'll pet her longer than I ever have and I'll get down the ground and just like, let this dog know she's loved. And the kids go out there, Reba, and pet the dog and pet the dog. What, what's happening? You know, our hope now is that she will so delight in being around our house that there's no reason for her to ever run away again. As I asked the kids this morning, hey, has Reba run away lately? No. I don't remember the last time that she's gone over to the neighbor's house. Why? Because what's happened, she's learning to delight in the fact that we're here. I'm like, man, if that's a dog, what about for people? Because here's what I think happens to us sometimes. We think Christianity is about the beep, beep, beep. Oh, don't, oh man, how, how close can I get to the edge before the, the beep, beep, beep? Oh, you know, ugh, I like, I just, I, this, this sin or whatever. It's like, and then the guilt and the shame and the, the buzz and the shock in our lives. We're like, oh, you know, we think about this taking communion. We're like, we focus on all the, oh, the weight. And some of you are sitting here and you just feel condemned and like, oh, it's, it's heavy. But why do I tell that story? It's simply this. I think that God's whole idea was the delight. He's like, man, if you discover the delight in me, you'll never be around the beep, beep, beep. You're never going to experience the shock. You'll just have relied completely on me. You'll realize there's a joy in knowing and serving Christ that answers everything in here. It's your heart gets tuned to him. And how does he say it? Romans 6.23 he says this, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Zoe life, like all, all of what delight life was meant to be. He says it's in him. It's not just that. It's eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. Perfect timing. So you have your emblems this morning? You know, and I think we remember is that there's a cost to sin, but Jesus also says, hey, when he took the cup, he's like, I want to remind you that the price has been paid. It's fully paid. When I said it is finished, I meant it. The price is paid in full. It's the word to telestai, which is like, that, that's what that means, paid in full. It's this good news that gives us the chance to just say, huh, Okay, I'm not going to try hard. I'm not going to whatever. I'm not my own effort. I'm not going to rely on me. Jesus, I just surrender to you. I just surrender to you and to your grace. And may I rely on your grace. So before we take communion, I just want to challenge each of us this morning to think about where we stand today. Are we trusting our efforts or are we trusting his sacrifice? Maybe today is, the, is, is first an opportunity for you to turn your life towards him. That you would stop, you know, living for yourself. You'd stop trying to do it yourself, by yourself, on your own strength. Stop trying to fix yourself or conquer addiction or be a better person. You're not closer. You might think you are, but you are not closer, and time will prove me right. Or you can say, no, I'm going to turn to him. I'll repent of sin. I'll surrender to God. I'll receive his free gift of salvation in life. Maybe this morning you're one of the wanderers and you're like, yeah, you know what? I've kind of been more on the perimeter. I've, I'm always around the beep, 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 and I'll come back to church to hopefully feel better. And you're missing out. That, that's not what this one's about at all. You know, where you would say, I'm going to come back to God and God, I'm going to pursue you. I just am. I'm just going to pursue you daily. I don't know what it all looks like, but you know my heart. I want to know you. And then I want to know you more. And I want to live ready for your return. I'm not going to play Christianity. I'm going to be your follower, and trust you no matter what I face. And for the, the reminder, you know, that that is of his goodness, his grace, his kindness, just his amazingness. It reminds us of that. And that it would kindle that desire in us to just delight in him, to delight in him, because that's what it's all about. And so today, as you take that bread, you got it in your hand, you realize that Jesus said, so we, you know, just to read those words from 1 Corinthians 11 again, it says, and he broke the bread in pieces. And he said to those, his followers, this is my body, which is broken or given for you on behalf of you. So every time you take this, do this to remember me. So this morning, that is what we do, Jesus. We remember the sacrifice. We remember that it was broken for us together. We honor you as we take this together.
Lord, every one of us has a past. Every one of us has a laundry list of regrets, a laundry list of sins. They're different. And so each of us individually, Lord, today we thank you for washing those away. We thank you for paying our penalty. We thank you for paying it in full. That your body was broken so that ours could be healed. Your body was broken so that we could be truly made whole. That you were nailed to that cross so that we would be free. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the price you paid. We remember it today. I'm grateful for it. It says, after dinner, he took a cup. And he said, this is, confirms the agreement. There's a new covenant. Something has happened. There's no, there's no sacrificing animals for the forgiveness of sin anymore. He's like, once and for all, his blood shed, that we might be forgiven and free. That is good news. Not, he died on a cross so you can sit in a pew. It's so much better than that. That you might know him. That you might be welcomed into his presence every single day. He says, you know what? When you take this, do it to remember that and remember me. And so we do that together. Right now in your seat or home watching online, would you just take a minute to thank him in your own words? Maybe you do it in your mind. Maybe you're going to whisper those words to him. Maybe you're going to shout it out. I don't care. Jesus, we're thankful. Thankful for what new life means for us. Thank you for your love that you've lavished on us. Thank you for the beauty of grace. Lord, that we don't have to rely on our efforts even now, just that we truly can rely on you. Thank you for the peace that it brings. Thank you for the load that it lifts off of our shoulders. Thank you for the hope that it gives us that we, we don't have to ignore or pretend that the pain and trouble doesn't exist, but we look forward to you. Look forward to the time when all of that is gone. Look forward to glory because of what you've done. Jesus, we, we honor you today. We seek you, desire to follow you, to live lives of gratitude for what you've done for us. May you shine through us today wherever we find ourselves. Lord, may you be glorified in and through our lives. <laughs> may your world be affected in a, in a positive way because of what happened here this morning. Lord, and may uh, I just pray, Holy Spirit, you keep drawing on our hearts every day to come and pursue you, to find you, to know you, to do life with you. I love you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.
this morning, it's not about, oh, we went to church and we read the scripture. It, it doesn't matter unless our hearts are open to it.